Come join me on my second channel, Jaguar Gator 8, where we'll talk all things college football. New video drops every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch the latest video. And now, on with our feature presentation. Even though the sports world is divided on many things, and even though fans of different teams have their differences, there are some things that every sports fan can universally agree on. They hate it when their team loses. They hate it when the referee misses a call. They hate it when they buy tickets to an event, they arrive at the venue, and because of the weather or some other circumstance, it gets moved to the next day. And when it comes to broadcast, I think it's safe to say that they absolutely hate watching games on tape delay. No one likes watching games after they happen, commercials and all. If you give someone the option to watch a game in real time or on tape delay, and we're assuming that the game is taking place at a reasonable hour, I'm sure literally every single person would say real time. And it makes perfect sense as to why that is. No one likes being spoiled. No one likes watching things on a delay. No one likes not being in the loop. But what you might not realize is that for years, and I mean years, when it came to Monday Night Football games taking place in Seattle, that's exactly what happened. And in 1983, a giant controversy erupted when this controversial broadcasting practice backfired in spectacular fashion, causing a ton of people to have the result of the game get spoiled. This is the story behind one of the biggest broadcasting controversies, especially on the part of an affiliate, in the over half-century-long history of Monday Night Football. Before I talk about the controversy in question, we need some context to understand how the game was going before the spoiler, and perhaps most importantly, why the heck this practice even existed in the first place. And I have to note before going any further, that in no way whatsoever was this an industry standard practice. When Monday Night Football started at 9 o'clock Eastern back in the 1980s, the starting time was not staggered across the country. The game started at 9 o'clock Eastern, and in 99% of the country, you were watching it at 9 o'clock Eastern. However, for some reason, if you lived in Seattle, this was not the case. Even though the game would start at 6 o'clock local time in real life, you would only see the game beginning at 7 o'clock, with whatever you're seeing being one hour behind what the rest of the country was seeing. There was an exception made if the Seahawks were playing on Monday Night Football, otherwise you were straight out of luck if you wanted to watch it live. Why did Seattle's ABC affiliate, KOMO, make this seemingly bizarre decision when no other affiliate in the country outside of the sister station down in Portland, Oregon, do the same exact thing? Well, as you probably guessed, it all comes down to ratings. Now, don't get me wrong, there were a ton of people opposed to this practice, and a ton of bars would make money off of the seemingly outdated tape delay practice, as they would use a satellite feed to show the game live. However, it made sense to KOMO station president Pat Scott to show the game on a delay. As Scott said, in 1970, when ABC announced they would go with Monday Night Football, senior management looked at our program schedule. As a general rule, football doesn't make any sense at 6 p.m. And in some regards, he was right at the time to be hesitant. Remember, Monday Night Football was a gigantic gamble at first, and ABC aired it out of necessity because they were so far behind CBS and NBC in the ratings for the Big Three that they figured they had nothing to lose. Especially when you remember that people are still getting home from work at 6 o'clock, and when you consider the fact that the NFL never played games on weeknights before outside of extremely rare circumstances, it made some sense why some affiliates like this one wanted to wait until 7 o'clock instead of 6 o'clock to show the game. Plus, it's not like people could look up what was happening on their phones or on the internet. And it's not like tape delay was a new concept, as CBS aired NBA games on tape delay. Turns out, by Seattle airing the game on tape delay, the ratings were pretty big. Now, this could be your classic case of correlation not equaling causation, the KOMO strategy was that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Scott emphasized that it fit the affiliate's core values to show the news over Monday Night Football Live, saying, We have a long-standing commitment to provide national news at 6 and local news at 6.30. There are a number of people who come home and turn to us for news coverage. There was a strong concern that we carry out our then very strong mandates. It wasn't fair to deprive people who wanted to watch their news. Additionally, he added, Each time you don't air the news in its regularly scheduled time period, it allows people to watch news somewhere else at the time. When they sample the competitor, they're likely to stay there five days a week. Scott emphasized that if he did not do this, a ton of people would miss the start of the game, saying, A lot of people still are coming home at 6 p.m. Look at the freeways. They're jammed. And Scott emphasized the high ratings that the news got. KOMO was the number one rated news station in the Seattle market at the 6 o'clock hour, scoring a 13.2 rating. On top of that, airing the game at 7 o'clock one hour later worked incredibly well for the station from an advertising and a rating standpoint. Seattle's tape delay broadcast beat the national average rating for Monday Night Football by 2.5 points, which was pretty significant. Over 95% of the time, they were above the national average. 
At a station press relations coordinator, Kim Nacella said on the situation, We have almost a fourth of the audience. It makes no sense to change when we're the highest rated station. When more people watch us, we can charge more for commercials. Advertisers want to be where more people are watching the shows. In other words, KOMO had the best ratings of any news station. And even though the football fans were upset to not see the game live and to watch it one hour behind, they were still watching and drawing higher ratings than the national average. KOMO was telling its Seattle football fans, Tough luck. This system works for us. And it seems to work for you guys, too. But there was one night in particular that this was way more frustrating than the rest. Because during one of the most anticipated Monday Night Football games ever, a ton of people in one of the largest TV markets in the country were spoiled in a disastrous way, in about the worst way possible. September 5th, 1983. It's week one of a brand new NFL season, and we're at RFK Stadium for this NFC East rivalry, and one of the biggest rivalries in all of football at that, between Dallas and Washington. This was the first nationally televised game of the season. And let's just say that the schedule makers could not have picked a better and more anticipated first game than this one. In one corner, you had Washington, the defending Super Bowl champion after defeating Miami at Super Bowl 17 the year before during the strike short in 1982 season. You can learn more about their Super Bowl win and the forgotten play that won them the game by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And in the other corner, you had Dallas, the most popular team in the country. The Cowboys have made it to the NFC Championship in each of the past three seasons, and were consistently a threat as long as Tom Landry was calling the shots. If you go back to Week 12 in the 1981 season and look at the two teams in their combined records, excluding the games that they played against each other, where someone had to win by default, you get two teams that were a combined 26-5 for a winning percentage of just under 84%. And since that week, the only two games that Washington lost came against none other than the Dallas Cowboys. In other words, if you were a football fan, you were circling this state on your calendar with the brightest and heaviest red marker you had at your disposal. Because considering the circumstances, this might have been the most anticipated Monday Night Football season opener of all time. Early on, it seemed like Washington was picking up right where they left off, as just like the last meeting in the NFC Championship, where Washington played great defense in the first half and built up a double-digit lead, they did the same thing here. The hometown Washington crowd wanted to celebrate their Super Bowl title and wanted to get on their feet, and they were able to do that when on the very first drive of the game, Washington was able to drive down the field thanks to some nice gains from Alvin Garrett and John Riggins. Washington set off for a chip-shot 23-yard field goal from the reigning MVP, their kicker, Mark Mosley, who you can learn more about by clicking the card on the upper right corner. After the Cowboys go 3 and out on back-to-back -back drives, with Washington playing great defense and forcing pressure against the run and the pass, Washington ends the quarter by jumping out to a 10-0 lead. Quarterback Joe Theismann was able to get Washington in the red zone on a nice throw up the middle to Alvin Garrett. Jake Gibbs wanted to get this, kid, and that little monkey gets loose, doesn't he? And then a few plays later, as was seemingly tradition by this point, eventual Hall of Fame running back John Riggins punched it in from one yard out. The Cowboys finally got on the scoreboard on the ensuing drive when Rafael Septien hit a 26-yard field goal to make it 10-3. However, it was very clear that Dallas was struggling big time offensively. They got into field goal range on this great 77-yard run by eventual Hall of Fame running back Tony Dorsett. Take that run out, and they finished the first quarter with negative two net yards of offense, along with less than four minutes of possession and a quarterback in Danny White who was 0 for 5. And it didn't help matters much when Washington got the ball back, immediately proceeded to drive down the field with some nice runs and big throws by Theismann to Rich Walker and Charlie Brown, and retake a 10-point lead. Tack on another field goal on the next drive set up by some great field position off of a giant punt return by Mike Nelms, with this kick coming from 39 yards out to make it 16-3. And then, tack on another score by Washington, with this one coming on a 41-yard pass by Theismann to Charlie Brown. And it seemed like the route was on, as Washington was leading at 23-3 late in the second quarter. For most of the country when they saw this, they were in awe of what they were watching, and the absolute beatdown that was taking place on their screens. But in Seattle, there was a ton of confusion because if there was ever a time for the tape delay procedure that KOMO had to backfire in spectacular fashion, it just had to be this game. Before I go any further, I want to emphasize what the weather was like in the Seattle-Tacoma area at the time where this incident happened. Because after this incident, our good friend Pat Scott that we mentioned earlier blamed the problem on atmospheric conditions. However, there seemed to be no problems whatsoever in the atmosphere. By the time Seattle was seeing what was unfolding in the second quarter, it was sometime around 8 p.m., since the game started at 6 p.m. in actuality and started airing in the area at 7 p.m. There were completely clear skies. The skies were so clear, in fact, 
that visibility reached over 25 miles. If we looked at the wind speeds, well, there was no wind whatsoever to speak of. It was somewhere around 3 miles per hour, which for all intents and purposes, is nothing. It was a near-perfect day. However, despite there being no clouds and no wind to speak of, somehow, there was a problem with the atmospheric conditions that prevented KOMO from airing the feed to its viewing audience. The problem came while the people were watching the second quarter of the game, and lasted for roughly 10 minutes. After the interruption, the station issued an apology, and viewers got to watch the rest of the game. Alright, so on paper, this doesn't seem to be a giant issue, right? Yes, it stinks that people weren't able to watch a few plays of the game, but this was just a technical difficulty that was fixed, and though this was a major inconvenience, people were able to watch after a few minutes of waiting, which I'm sure felt like an eternity for any football fans after staring at a black screen. So what's the big deal? Well, think of what people do if something goes wrong with their broadcast and they can't fix it. They look for alternative ways to watch or listen to the broadcast and stay in touch. Today, this could mean finding a stream or following along on the ESPN app with a play-by-play, -play or anything like that. But back in 1983, this meant something completely different. You couldn't check the internet or your smartphone to figure out what was going on. If the TV signal failed, you went to what the video killed. You went to the Radio Star. And I think you might be able to see where the problem is coming. Because for a lot of people in the Seattle area, they didn't know or didn't realize that the game was tape delayed, especially since this was the first game of the season. Or they thought that the TV feed in Seattle would be synced up with the radio feed in Seattle. Alas, it was not. Because when the TV signal went out because of KOMO's error, I don't care if they want to blame the atmosphere conditions because the atmosphere was perfectly fine, to see what was going on, they tuned into the radio broadcast. The problem with that? The radio broadcast was in real time, and was an hour ahead of whatever the heck the people in Seattle and Tacoma were watching at the time of the outage. When the radio broadcast aired, instead of it being the second quarter, it was the third quarter. I remember that radio broadcasts frequently give score updates, since they cannot provide visuals. So instead of Washington being up 23-3, a bunch of people were stunned to find out that out of nowhere, Dallas had scored two touchdowns to get right back in the game as following a 75-yard touchdown pass by Danny White to Tony Hill, and following a 51-yard touchdown pass by White to Hill, it was now a 23-7 ball game. And to say that people were furious, and understandably so, would be a massive understatement. Because now, through no fault of their own, and through the incompetence of their ABC affiliate, they had this incredible comeback spoiled. It caused one writer to say afterwards that KOMO's policy was a cop-out, and that the station's priorities took precedent over the station's viewers. And even though the game turned out to be an incredibly exciting contest, with Dallas coming all the way back and winning a 31-30 to pull off a stunning comeback by scoring 28 straight points, the excitement was dampened significantly by people in Seattle not being able to see the comeback. And then, people being spoiled of said comeback happening. Much like movies aren't as fun if you know what happens, sports aren't as fun if you know what's going to happen. And a lot of people in Seattle were straight up not having a good time. Even after this debacle, KOMO did not change its policy. The NFL, for some reason, did not force KOMO to change its policy, and did not mandate its TV deal with ABC for the rights to broadcast the game that every network affiliate must air it live. And it wasn't until 1996 when KOMO finally decided to cave in and get rid of their quarter-century-long policy of tape delaying the game, with General Manager Dick Wozinski saying that because of technological shifts and changes in viewing patterns, the delay was not serving the largest football audience. Translation, we were finally starting to take a hit in the ratings. Here's live footage of KOMO announcing their decision to finally air Monday Night Football games live, after over 25 years of not doing this, and more than a decade after one of the most disastrous local broadcasts of all time. But even though the struggle was finally over, it's insane that after this incident in 1983, nothing changed for over a decade until the affiliate's hand was forced by declining ratings and mounting pressure. Showing a game on tape delay makes sense if you want to get a primetime audience, and said primetime audience cannot receive that content in any way whatsoever beforehand, so the impact of the game being tape delayed is non-existent. On the other hand, showing a game on tape delay when your error causes people who want to follow the action to be spoiled and just have an entire hour of the broadcast completely ruined for them is downright disgusting. In Seattle, all the rowdy friends who were here on Monday night were here for an hour longer than they would have liked, and on opening day in 1983, saw far less of the game from an unsuspecting viewer standpoint than they wanted to.
Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar 9 To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.